Order. Thank you. It's nice to have a room full of people today to uh, <laughs> visit with. We're glad you're here with us. Uh, this is the uh, October 27th uh, meeting of the Mississippi State Board of Education. I'm Rosemary Altman, and I have the privilege of serving as chair. The first thing I would ask is you make sure you, your cell phone is off um, or on silent, unless it'll be like mine happened. It'll ring in the middle of a meeting. So, um, And for those who are joining us um, live stream, if you would make certain that yours is silenced also so we can... Um, conduct our business. We, for those of you who may not know, we are uh, at, well obviously you know because you found the building, but we're at the Mississippi School Boards Association building because uh, construction is going on at the MDE building at Central High School downtown. So we do appreciate uh, the School Board Association allowing us to use their facilities. They've been very accommodating and we appreciate that. Uh, Mrs. Werner is joining us today virtually. Uh, Ms. Werner, would you just state your location? You don't have to give your address, just your location. Saltillo, Mississippi. Okay, and Mr. Jacobs is also joining us virtually. Uh, he looks like he's in a fun place. Mr. Jacobs, would you state your location, please? I'm at a water color store. Okay. Uh, and uh, Dr. Elam is out of the country, so she is not with us today. So only having uh, four members present and two joining us virtually, uh, when I call for a motion, somebody move, please. <laughs> so we're not just uh, sitting here waiting for somebody to say yes. Um, our uh, pledge today will be led by Mr. East, and I will lead the invocation. If you will stand, please, and join us. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Join me in prayer, please. Our Father, we thank you for a beautiful fall day. We thank you for the uh, many things that we see your handiwork every day as, as the uh, air cools and the trees change. We're just so aware of the beautiful world that we live in. We pray that you'll be with us as we conduct the business of this meeting, that you'll be with us as we make decisions that impact uh, the children of the state and those who teach them every day. We're very grateful for those people who've dedicated their lives to make, the, make a difference in the lives of the children that they uh, are responsible for every day and for the impact that they have. We're grateful for their dedication, their diligence, and the knowledge that they share. Go with us now as we go on through this week and into the Thanksgiving season. We pray that we'll always be grateful for the many blessings that we have and that we'll always strive to stay in the center of your will. In the name we pray, amen. amen. Okay, our first item is to approve the minutes of the September 29th meeting, uh, 2022 board meeting. Do I have a motion? So moved. Okay. Uh, Dr. McGee, <laughs> y'all are doing good. <laughs> Sometimes I'm up here like, okay, come on. Dr. McGee and Mr. East, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Uh, we have our, uh, you have been presented the agenda. Are there any I, uh, additions or deletions to the agenda? Okay, hearing none, the consent agenda, do you uh, have any items you'd like pulled out for discussion? All right, hearing none, then uh, we will adopt the agenda as presented. Do I have a motion to adopt the agenda as you have? So moved. Okay. Move. So moved. All right. <laughs> We're going to move right along in this meeting. <laughs> uh, Mr. Miller and Dr. Barrett, um, all in favor? Aye. Any Aye. opposed? Thank you. Aye. Uh, we are uh, pleased today to have a number of recognitions. Uh, for the uh, National Blue Ribbon Schools. Um, that's a wonderful recognition for 
uh, schools around the state. And so I'm going to turn it over to uh, Dr. Benton and Ms. Cook to um, make the recognitions. Okay, thank you. Good morning, Ms. Altman, morning. Dr. Benton, and board members. <clears throat> Today we are recognizing Mississippi's National Blue Ribbon Schools for 2022. The U.S. Department of Education grants this designation annually across the country to schools that are among the highest performing in their state or have made the most progress in closing achievement gaps. Only 297 <coughs> schools in the United States earned the National Blue Ribbon Award status in 2022. This, is, this award is truly a badge of honor for each school. The National Blue Ribbon School Program recognizes schools in one of two categories, based on sc student scores, subgroup student scores, and graduation rates. The National Blue Ribbon School Program recognizes schools um, exemplary high, the two categories are, excuse me, exemplary high performing schools are among the state's highest performing schools as measured by state assessments on nationally normed tests. Exemplary achievement gap closing schools are among the state's highest performing schools in closing achievement gaps between a school's groups and all student groups. We are proud to have two Mississippi schools in each of these two categories. First, we will recognize the exemplary high performing schools. The first school is Hayes Cooper Center in the Cleveland School District. I would like to invite Principal Renee Lamastis to join Ms. Altman and Dr. Benton at the front of the boardroom. Okay. The Hayes Cooper Center is a magnet school with a focus on the arts that has earned an A rating every year since the 2017-18 school year. It is a diverse school that celebrates the cultures it serves with different approaches to reach all children. The school boasts a collaborative spirit in which the school community works together to provide special opportunities and events for children such as overnight educational trips, whole school celebrations, and rewards such as nine-week challenges during which students celebrate academic and positive behavioral intervention supports, or PBIS, accomplishments. Students start their day reciting the Patriots Code, which is Patriots are persistent, ambitious, trustworthy, respectful, innovative, organized, tolerant, and self-controlled. Ms. Lamastis, you are welcome to make remarks at this time. I brought my phone because my leadership team is with me and I tend to say whatever if I don't have something, okay? Um, we serve 287 children, pre-K through sixth grade. Um, Hayes Cooper became um, a magnet school in 1991. I'm the third principal. I've had 28 years in education and 16 of them have been at Hayes Cooper. Um, when I became the principal, I wanted to not only do what the people before me achieved, I wanted to do more, and one of my goals was to be a National Blue Ribbon School, and so here we are, so I guess I can go home now. <laughs> um, we all know that schools, that I'm only a small part of what makes Hayes Cooper a great school. It is the school community. We have incredible parents, students, and most of all, my faculty. Um, that school runs and because of the faculty I have. I don't want them to stand up. I brought every one of them, not all of them. We had to have school today. But I brought my leadership team that is with me every step of the way. And I do want to say that when I became a principal, I really didn't believe in leadership teams because I thought everybody should be a leader on your faculty and staff. But our superintendent kind of required me to have one. <laughs> And it's been instrumental to helping me. They're a great sounding board, and I so appreciate them, and I wanted them to be here with me today. Thank you. The second school in this category is Petal High School in the Petal School District. I invite Principal Tyler Watkins to join Ms. Altman and Dr. Benton at the front of the room. I'm going to invite a few more. I don't want teachers to come up here Petal High School is home to nearly 1,300 students across grades 9 through 12. Among its 102 teachers, 16 are National Board Certified, two are Mississippi Teachers of the Year, one is a Milken Award-winning educator, and one is a James Madison Fellowship recipient. Petal High School students are highly motivated. They took 698 advanced placement and dual 
credit courses last year, and 37 students scored 30 or higher on the ACT. Among the many factors in the success of Petal High School is its commitment to professional learning communities. The district makes a tremendous commitment to this cornerstone practice by ensuring all core subject area teachers have daily 90, I'm sorry, excuse me, 48 minute professional learning community. Mr. Watkins, you are welcome to make remarks at this time. Thank you. Um, you know, I really wanted our teachers to be up here uh, a part of this. this like, uh, like they said, that, that that's our secret sauce, um, the, the teachers we have. Uh, and it's really just the people. It's the little people in the buildings. It's our, our, our students, it's our faculty, and then it's our community. Um, we, we really put a lot of thought in uh, to our daily PLCs, uh, and that's where really the magic happens with that. So I'm uh, very thankful for the people that we work with at Petal High School. Uh, and I'm happy to represent uh, Mississippi also with this national award. Thank you. Now we will recognize the exemplary achievement gap closing schools. The first school is Florence Elementary School in the Rankin County School District. I invite Principal Amanda Clark to join Ms. Altman and Dr. Benton at the front of the room. <laughs> Florence Elementary educators are also highly qualified. Three teachers have earned their National Board certification and four others are currently working toward their National Board certification. 19 employees have AA certification, one has AAA certification, and one has quadruple A certification. Eight teacher leaders presented professional development sessions this year at the district level and at state conferences hosted by the Mississippi Educational Computing Association and the Mississippi Association for Gifted Children. Florence Elementary students are just as accomplished. Across the Rankin County School District, they rank number one in reading proficiency, number two in math proficiency, and number three in science proficiency. Not surprisingly, the school also ranks among the top in the state in reading, math, and science proficiency. Ms. Clark, you may, are welcome to make remarks at this time. On behalf of Florence Elementary and all of our teachers, students, parents, and staff, we are honored for this achievement. Um, I would love to have all of our teachers here today, but of course we can't get subs for all of them, but they are. <laughs> They are the backbone of our school, and while we are receiving this award, they work so hard every single day, and so it is an honor to be able to receive this award on behalf of our students and our staff and our parents and our teachers, so thank you. And I'd like to say thank you to Dr. Rimes and Karen Smith for being here. Um, they are our district leaders, and they are important to help us be successful in our school. Thank you. The final school is Oak Grove Lower Elementary School in the Lamar County School District. I invite Lamar County Superintendent Dr. Stephen Hampton to join Ms. Altman, Dr. Benton at the front of the room. And I'll note Lamar County reorganized elementary schools this summer, so Oak Grove Lower Elementary School students and staff are now split between Oak Grove Elementary and Bellevue Elementary. In the 21-22 school year, Oak Grove Lower Elementary School was a leader in Lamar County School District's student attendance percentages. The school was also a positive behavioral interventions and supports Model 1 school. As a result of these positive practices, Oak Grove Lower Elementary School third graders saw a 17% increase in English language arts scores on the statewide math assessment and a 21% increase in math scores. The school's universal screener results showed second and third graders who scored in the lowest quartile at the beginning of the year improved significantly over the course of the school year. Dr. Hampton, you are welcome to make remarks at this time. Well, thank you. It's a huge honor for us to be up here to receive this recognition, and it's truly a recognition of our teachers and staff, and we do have some. I would like for you guys to stand up, please. Uh, <laughs> So you heard some of the results that we received, but these teachers and the staff, and not only the teacher staff, but our parents and our community really wrapped around and just worked really hard. 
and and it's so nice to be recognized for that hard work and what they what they put into uh, this award and and it's it's an honor and that that starts with leadership and this is Dr. Brumfield and I, I just want to recognize her for her leadership and her leadership team uh, to to have this recognition is just validation to the hard work that our teacher staff the whole staff and our community put into this. Thank you. As we were making those presentations, I was thinking, you know, it's so easy to get bogged down in all the challenges that we have to deal with and that you deal with every day. But there are so many good things going on in schools around our state. And it's important that we stop and celebrate those good things and um, continue challenging our students. And um, as you challenge them, they typically will step up if they're given the resources and uh, <clears throat> the time to do it. And so we uh, thank you for what you're doing every day in your schools and uh, the recognition that you're bringing not only to your community but to the state. And we um, challenge you to continue doing that. Uh, so thank you all for being here. Uh, you're welcome to stay, but I know you're anxious to get back. So those of you who would like to leave, you certainly may. to the report of, of the state superintendent. Good morning. That is a hard act to follow, Ms. <laughs> Altman, for sure, for sure. Well, it's been a busy month meeting with stakeholders and traveling to districts around the state for school visits and special events. This month, we have visited a number of districts. We visited Tunica County, Franklin County, Jefferson County, South Panola, Holmes County, Petal, and last Friday, Pascagoula Gaucher. And I also had the opportunity to attend a virtual community meeting for Jefferson Davis County. These trips are really important. They provide us an opportunity to see high quality instruction in pre-K through high school, including high school career and technical education centers. We were delighted to visit in three of those this past month. We've also had the opportunity to attend two really exciting celebrations for two outstanding educators in our state. Last week, we attended the award ceremony, the Millican Educator Award Ceremony for Tyler Shows. He's a fifth grade math teacher in upper, at the Upper Elementary School in Petal, and he received a reward, an award, I guess you could consider it a reward, for his service of $25,000. That was so exciting to see how excited the children were for their teacher. That was very heartwarming. Then we also, earlier in the month, were able to see the excitement of Christy Jones. Christy Jones is a carpentry teacher, a female carpentry teacher in Franklin County. And there at their career center, uh, as she works with students, she actually started as a third grade te a special education teacher, excuse me, and then moved over to the Career Technical Center. And she received the Harbor Freight Excellence in Teaching Award. And she received an award of $100,000. Yeah, that was a wow, too. She said that, as did her students. And it was really a nice moment there. And 70000 of those dollars will be used and invested right back in that career center, which was exciting because you know how expensive that can be to secure that type of equipment, um, and it'll go a long way. And the remainder, of course, is for her personally. Now, these celebrations acknowledge the great work 
that's taking place across our schools each and every day in classrooms and the outstanding work of teachers. I also had the honor to be involved in a number of other events across the state. One was the presidential inauguration at William Carey University for Dr. Ben Burnett, a former Lamar County, in fact, superintendent, who continues to support our work and work really closely with Dr. Murphy and Dr. Vanderford and Burson and Ben Cleave, all of that teaching and leading group. I also had the opportunity to present and meet with the Mississippi School Public Relations Directors, and that was, that was a very um, productive meeting as well as the Mississippi Council on Economic Education, the Mississippi Volunteer Commission, Accelerate Mississippi, that's advancing workforce training and career and technical programs across our state, and then uh, capped it off earlier this week with an opportunity to meet with administrators who were, were attending the Mississippi Association of School Administrators fall convening. Two other highlights were the Student Advisory Council meeting and the Principal Advisory Council meeting. During the Student Advisory Council meeting, and we, Micah was busy taking care of business in her district, we missed her that day, but there were 75 students that were able to join, and we used that time for an introductory period, but also to find out what was top of mind for them. And then we'll use that information as we plan a face-to-face -face meeting in January, or late January, early February. Um, then the principals meeting. Ms. Altman joined us in Clinton and we were joined by about 42 principals from across the state uh, and learned lots of wonderful things. And probably the highlight of that was our tour of the extraordinary Career and Technical Education Center at Clinton High School. If you haven't seen that, I encourage you to take a field trip. It was amazing and we had the privilege to be served a wonderful lunch prepared by the culinary arts students and I have to tell you that Mr. Bill Harden, the director there, he surely was modeling that servant leadership and no wonder the students emulate that as they interacted with us. They weren't just learning and taking a, a career and technical education course, they were learning how to cooperate, um, be customer service friendly, uh, and all sorts of other things in the process. I've continued to meet with legislators. Holly Spivey and I had a very productive meeting with Senate Education Chair Dennis DeBar, as well as Vice Chair David Blunt. Now, I want to spend just a minute and talk to you about NAEP. Our board members, as well as all of you in the audience, had seen, I'm sure, the press release that uh, regarding the NAEP results, which highlighted that Mississippi has maintained our historic grade gains in, on NAEP in fourth grade reading and math. Let me let that settle a minute. That's something to be proud of. Those historic gains haven't come easy. And that was, it put Mississippi a bit as an outlier compared to the national decline. Now, Mississippi, over the past 10 years, has been a leader among the few states that have shown improvement on one or more of the NAEP assessments. Since 2011, Mississippi has improved significantly in reading and math in fourth grade, and we've held steady in our eighth grade performance. Between 2019 and 2022, two administrations of NAEP, more than 30 states declined in fourth and eighth grade reading, and 40 declined in fourth and eighth grade math. There's a lot of work to be done. 50 states plus Washington, D.C. declined in eighth grade math specifically. The 2022 results underscore the urgent need to continue to press forward with our six goals of the State Board of Education and to ensure that all of our students reach proficiency. In particular, we have more work to do to bring student performance up to the national average in eighth grade reading and math, and then to go right past that uh, and show what our students are capable of in Mississippi. We're gonna keep our expectations high to accelerate student learning based on the best evidence-based practices available for all of our students. All six of your goals, our goals of the Board of Education, have included in there either the word all 
are every. And that's what we are intently focused on. We're going to continue to study not only our NAEP data, but our MAP data. In a few minutes, you will see a heat map, gap scores, uh, all sorts of data points. You, you might be a little heavy, your head might be a little hurting after <laughs> our presentations today, but I want you to know that we're spending time really drilling into that information to make sure that we provide each of our students with the education they deserve. One example of how we are meeting the needs of students with disabilities was the adoption of the Mississippi Alternate Diploma. And we have a short video clip, about a five or six minute clip, that we'd like to share with you so that you can see two of our first graduates. Jonathan. These two graduates um, attended Pearl High School. In the 2018-2019 school year, Mississippi introduced new diploma options to increase college and career opportunities for all students. The new diploma options included the Mississippi Alternate Diploma, which enables students with the most significant cognitive disabilities to gain entry into specialized post-secondary educational and vocational programs. My name is Mary Hill. I'm studying my alternate diploma, and I want to be a makeup artist and a nursing assistant. Hey, I'm Lisa Baldwin, and I'm a self-contained special ed teacher at Pearl High School. When I first met Shandaria two years ago um, as a junior, she's always interested in makeup and cosmetology and also on the on a side note she wanted to do something in the medical field so she was a lot of fun to work with and um, brainstorm with and help her research where she wanted to go I want to be able to take care of myself and um, make good money you know have a good life don't let nothing hold her back because of her disability she can do anything she want to do so at Project Search, she will get to have some experiences in the medical field, and then she can decide um, after completing this program if that's a field that she would like to stay in, and if so, they will help her find employment. So we're really excited about Project Search. Um, Project is a program that helps kids with disabilities like me get a job. I'm going to be Trade like, in different fields to see what I'm good at. For like, I think it's two weeks. Two, two weeks. And if she get hired, if they like her and they hire her and she agrees to it, she can start working for the university. So, hopefully, I get hired. Last year was the first year for our students to graduate with a full alternate diploma. And in our classroom, we had three students, and they they were excited because they got to participate with all the senior activities. It was a big deal and I, as a teacher, was excited to get to participate in that and have them walk across the stage and be there and from there, help them plan their future, where they're going um, and what they wanna do after high school. I'm excited to talk to you about the alternate diploma and all the opportunities that it uh, offers. The alternate diploma became an option for districts to offer as a graduation option for students with significant cognitive disabilities in 2018-2019. We just had our first cohort of graduates graduate in May of 2022. We had 112 graduates across the state of Mississippi in public schools that exited high school with the alternate diploma. The alternate diploma requires 24 Carnegie credit-bearing courses that students have to um, pass to earn the alternate diploma. They also must take the Mississippi Academic Assessment Program alternate, known as the MAP A, and score a passing or proficient level on the alternate assessment in high school English two, high school algebra one, and biology. The alternate diploma is rigorous. It's yeah, designed specifically for the alternate diploma four for career readiness, and all four are credit-bearing Carnegie unit courses. And then it also has four life skills courses that the students take one each year. And those are Carnegie unit credit-bearing courses as well. 
Other courses, they must take four Englishes, four maths, two science, and two social studies, along with some general education elective courses, PE, and a fine arts. We say all the time at the department that inclusion is a mindset, it's not a place. And so with the alternate diploma, it gives our students opportunities to engage with their non-disabled peers and be in that general education setting um, for the greatest extent possible so that they can be successful. Um, the alternate diploma gives them that opportunity to engage and interact in those um, courses. It gives them a chance to get those good academic skills and those great social skills from those interactions with peers. And MDE's role in all of that is we we're able to work with our legislators, work with our stakeholders, really get good input from our school leaders, um, superintendents, principals, parents, families, um, get that good feedback and develop a program that really provided opportunities for our students. Those teacher resource guides are developed for all of the alternate courses that we have. The, um, the four English, the math, the science, the social studies, the life skills development and career readiness. They have um, the alternate academic achievement standard, which is aligned to the general ed standard, but it also has the objectives and then it breaks those objectives down into I can statements for the students and for the teacher. I was glad to get it. I was happy that I got a diploma. I get to see my friends and teachers and the track comes from crossing the stage, taking pictures, proud. They, they didn't give up on me. They told me that I can do it. So I kept giving up. Very clear picture of what happens when we raise expectations, we support our students, we see what's possible. They have a lot to be proud of. There was only 112 this time, but each one of those 112 students and their families um, have new opportunities because of the vision um, of the department and the board and then the leadership in those schools to make sure that this option was available for these students. So they've graduated, they turned that tassel, and let me tell you that those students are participating this year in a year-long program, Project Search, in partnership with the University of Mississippi Medical Center. And in fact, the first young lady you saw, Shandaria, she was posting on social media this week that she had earned her driver's license, and she was pretty excited. So um, that, that concludes my comments this morning. Very good. Uh, this past month, I've spent a, a good bit of time with the consultant, uh, with McPherson, on getting ready to um, um, have interviews and complete applications and have interviews for the superintendent um, search. We uh, uh, will be updating the board about that later on today, um, but answered a lot of questions and um, have worked with Sonia and uh, her department, uh, Ms. Amos, on getting scheduling and all the details that have to be done to prepare for that. We're excited about that. Um, Dr. Benton and I have been in contact over several things <laughs> during the course of the month, much of what you've already heard about. Uh, but she did mention that I went to the uh, Principal's Advisory Committee meeting, and it was, it was very uh, interesting and uh, very lively discussion on all the topics that they had. Uh, the first one that they discussed was um, AP and dual credit and the difficulties uh, and the challenges with AP classes and uh, finding people to teach them and dual credit and the sales job that sometimes has to be done uh, to get uh, parents to understand the difference between or the value of dual credit and or AP uh, and lining those courses aligning those courses with um, college curriculum and the importance of counselors and the, and the guidance that they provide for the students to understand the correlation. And uh, the one thing that 
surprised me, I guess, although I knew it, was that uh, preparation actually needs to start in middle school for these, uh, these programs, that it's not just you get to high school and suddenly decide that's what you're going to do, but that students need to start preparing. Uh, the other thing that they discussed while I was there was the, uh, or the orientation to school leadership. Uh, and that was an interesting discussion that they uh, were looking for some solutions in the training. Um, they uh, wanted training that was aligned with the accreditation standards that would um, help them. And then also in, to work with entry level administrators to understand how to be effective leaders. And those of you who work every day in school districts know that a lot of what happens is you have to grow your own to be able to find people to uh, fill in those areas where you need them. And so having effective leaders uh, is very important. And they had a very good discussion about that. And then um, uh, it, the one question that kept uh, coming up was, uh, what do you wish you knew you, the first year you were a principal or a school administrator? And uh, what do you think that every career administrator needs to know to be able to um, be effective in Mississippi schools now. And so uh, anyway, it was a good day. And uh, there were a lot, as I said, a lot of uh, uh, lively discussion, a lot of opinions. And um, <laughs> as most people in education have opinions. And so anyway, I enjoyed it. It was, it was a good day. And um, I appreciate being able to be a part of that. And um, as Dr. Uh, Benton said, we're very proud of our, our career and technical facility in Clinton, and they got to see it in, uh, in operation with lunch, and the students who served it, prepared it, served it, and did the whole thing. So it was a good day. Uh, our student representatives, Michael, are you ready to give your report? Yes, ma'am. Um, this morning, I'm going to be talking about the improvement of the Laurel School District and how much we've grown this year. Um, Towards the beginning of my position as a student representative, I spoke about how my school district was an F school, lacking in certain areas, especially when COVID hit. Um, we saw more problems arise. And my first report was discussing the impact that COVID had on our district. During the school year 2019 to 2020, we did not have technology distributed to students in the school district. Not one Chromebook or tablet was used for schooling because there was no reason to at the time. But when the pandemic worsened and we realized we wouldn't be coming back in person for a while, teachers, administration, board members, and my superintendent were finding ways to combat the major loss of the school year. And one of the main problems that arose for students in my school district was a lack of food. And the pandemic didn't help where some parents didn't have jobs anymore to pay for food. Um, or other resources. So I applaud the workers who work behind the scenes in my school district and saw the problem, decided to be proactive by sending sack foods out every weekend to students who needed it. And when the 2020 through 2021 school year started, we finally had the distribution of Chromebooks and the funding for Chromebooks and tablets for every student in our school district. Hybrid and online learning was happening at the time, so we had funding for that. Um, it just took some time for us to adjust to these new learning habits um, especially for our students and for teachers as well. Slowly but surely, we start sensing a feeling of normality, where instead of online learning, we would all be hybrid, and then instead of hybrid, we'd all be in person. As, um, um, as we on the board saw in our meeting last week, well, not last week, I'm sorry, guys. Um, in our last meeting, the pandemic affected our test scores, and we saw a decrease in proficiency because of COVID. And I feel confident saying that although the pandemic was absolutely unexpected, unprecedented, and it sucked, um, <laughs> I love the resilience of my superintendent, board members, and administration, but especially teachers and fellow students who continue to pursue the education in their jobs. And there are a couple of improvements that I currently see with my district that I didn't see years before. Access to technology is one but we are providing more emphasis on the ACT and helping students get those scores up and how um, letting them know that ACT can be their gateway to a debt-free um, and quality education beyond high school. So we are starting to implement ACT classes, um, free ACT classes for all 11th grade and 12th grade students that wish to take them. 
And due to our new modified schedule, we started our school year earlier. I didn't, but they did. Um, and so they would have, um, every nine weeks, they would have a break, a two-week break, which is, you know, I'm a little jealous of that, but they worked hard for that. And um, I really appreciate our new modified schedule where students are able to, students who need remedial help are able to get it once a week. Um, I also knew that we weren't just an F school. Um, and I sit here today to say that I'm beyond proud of our progress and accountability leaders in our school district hold to everybody in my district. And the current rating that which we hold now is a C. So we're doing some great work in our school district. And this truly takes a team effort, and I'm glad to say that we have a strong team. I want to give a big shout out to my fellow students at Laurel School District who continue to defy the odds who don't let a rating define them and their success. And overall, a big shout out to Laurel School District for the tremendous growth we made this year. This is the beginning, um, this is just the beginning as we continue striving for excellence. And last thing, I recently did a pageant this um, month and now I'm serving as Miss Meridian's outstanding team and our state competition is gonna be in April. I'm so scared. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but this is very exciting and I'm looking forward to it and thank you. Well, thank you for that good report. Uh, Micah hit on any number of things there that we have stressed, ACT prep, mm -hmm. uh, uh, flexibility in scheduling, uh, those kinds of things that are making a difference in your school district. So thank you for that good report. Uh, our other report will be from uh, Charlie Frugge, who is our junior representative. Uh, some of you may know Charlie is in Washington for the time being, so he has sent his report by YouTube. <laughs> Hello, board. I uh, hope you're all doing well today. And I'm sure everyone's worked hard back in Jackson over the past month. So if anyone's keeping up with Washington, D.C., you know both chambers of Congress are in recess until November 14th. So for that reason, I don't have anything to report on the topic of national education legislation. However, I did have the opportunity to meet with Senator Wicker this past week and we spoke on a variety of topics, including our mutual love for correct grammar and his advice for me on my future education. Senator Wicker is working hard for people in Mississippi and his staff is fantastic. As I won't be reporting on national topics today, I'm very excited to report on my home district of Oxford and our impressive student government at Oxford High School. In early August, as many of you read in various news articles, Oxford had quite the dress code debacle. After claiming midsummer that neither the dress, co dress code nor enforcement had changed, the Oxford administration began handing down dress code violations to the girls in our secondary schools. Oxford parents were quite displeased with our newly enforced dress code policy, and the students were even more so. Petitions circulated and parents sent emails to our school administration, urging a change. However, I don't want to focus on the actual dress code itself, nor the parents who responded. I want to highlight the work of the students. The Oxford High School Student Council is an amazing group of highly motivated, well-rounded kids. We are led by one of my best friends, our student body president, Winnie Wilson. Winnie also happens to be the editor of The Charger, our student newspaper. Through her position as student body president, Winnie led our student council in discussions and meetings on the dress code. She researched other policies around the nation and got input from various students at Oxford. The student council provided great input about what they thought was unreasonable at the dress code, they also gave feedback on what was necessary in a new dress code. Our student government also had a discussion with our superintendent in which he dispelled many common myths and he answered many questions from our members. Additionally, Oxford's student newspaper wrote many pieces documenting the various experiences our students faced. This proved to be quite effective as I'm sure all of you heard about the dress code in early August. After all of these efforts, the Oxford High School Student Council proposed a new revised dress code to our local school board. Winnie utilized the public comment section of a local board meeting and gave input to our board members. At the time of my filming this video, there is a revised dress code in the public comment phase of passage that includes the language from the Student Council proposal. Time will tell if our dress code changes, but I am very proud of my student government. Through excellent leadership and thoughtful deliberation, our kids are making change the right way. For any Mississippi students watching this video, let Oxford student government be an example to you. I'm so very proud of my peers and the way in which they affected policy in our district. This is the type of thing that every district should strive for. 
I know the dress code is a hotly contested issue among administrators, and it is quite the pain to deal with, but every school should want kids who care about their school's policy and use the correct methods to change what they see fit. I'm very happy that I got to inform you all of all of these great students on our student council, and I wish you all a great month and hope that you will keep up with Oxford student government to see what we do next. Thank you. Okay, I think uh, both of these reports really show what we had hoped would happen with this uh, student representative. Uh, um, Micah has learned about the inner workings of her school district and what takes and uh, what it takes to have a good school district. And then uh, the fact that students are affecting policy change, hopefully, and, and are learning about policy and how policy impacts all that goes on. Um, is, are the things that we had hoped that they would learn as to how um, departments work, how school districts work, and so we're, we're pleased with what you all are doing and we thank you for your work. Um, I, do we have any education subcommittee meetings, uh, Mr. East? Thank you, Ms. Rosen. Uh, I could be with the Chief, but early childhood uh, yesterday afternoon on Zoom. Uh, there were four major topics. First one was probably more of a, a pre-meeting. Uh, we were discussing the importance of Jackson State and uh, ESPN being here for <laughs> <laughs> uh, great, great thing for our state. Yeah. Uh, in the education world, uh, Dr. Davis was able to report that he had over 100,000 activities on the paper, uh, the tutoring program we got, the, the donut competition that they sponsored went very well. We also learned uh, that the social studies curriculum will be needing to go back to a public uh, hearing based on the APA process, which I believe is in November the 18th, if I'm not mistaken. And then also on the agenda today is a discussion of the uh, literacy-based promotion act. Yeah. Today, so a good meeting and a lot of fun. So thank you very much. Well, good. All right. Thank you. Yeah, it's going to be exciting times in Jackson this weekend, so uh, it'll be fun to, to watch. Uh, we'll now move into our um, items on our agenda. Um, the first um, three or four are informational items, and the first one is on the Literacy-Based Promotion Act. So our team is making their way up up to the front and as they do I can go ahead and introduce them sure. to you. Um, these are familiar faces. In the blue jacket we have Dr. Marla Davis, one of our associate <coughs> superintendents in the Office of um, Academic Education and she's joined in the lavender by Kristen Wynn, our state director of literacy. And mm -hmm. then Dr. Tanette Smith who is our executive director of early childhood literacy and lots of other things, mm -hmm. right? Yes, in fact, you saw her last month when she was talking about some standards. But, ladies? Good morning, um, Good morning. Mrs. Altman, Dr. Benton, and members of the board. Again, I am Marla Davis, and with me today um, our State Literacy Director, Kristen Wynn, and our Executive Director for the Office of Elementary Education and Reading, Dr. Tanette Smith. We bring before you today an informational item on the Literacy-Based Promotion Act. And it brings me great pleasure to have these leaders here with me at the table today. Um, as you all are fully aware, Mississippi is now on the national map because of the work of this team and also the great group of literacy co coaches and directors that we have throughout the state. As we uh, begin all of our presentations here at the State Department, we always begin with the vision and mission. Of course, it is our vision to create a world-class educational system that gives students the knowledge and skills that they need to be successful in college and workforce. Our mission, of course, is to provide leadership through the development of policy and accountability systems so that all of our students are prepared to compete in a global community. Um, our Literacy-Based Promotion Act has uh, provided a trajectory for the state of Mississippi that was unprecedented. As you all are fully aware, we have been um, partners with 30 states across the country that has come to the state or has met with us virtually to see what has the state of Mississippi been doing as it relates to literacy and reading. Um, we, of course, um, make sure that everything that we do hits on each of our strategic goals. Uh, most specifically, our Literacy-Based Promotion Act hits on goals number one and two, ensuring that all students are proficient and showing growth in all assessed areas. 
And then goal number two, that every student graduates from high school and is ready for college and careers. Now, before Dr. Smith and um, Mrs. Wynn share with you our literacy-based promotion updates, our state um, reporting structure, and what we're going to do as a state as it relates to next steps for professional learning, I wanted to lay the foundation why this historic act is so important for the state of Mississippi and also for all of our students, because we want our students to make sure that even if they do not stay in the state of Mississippi, again, they're able to compete globally. So, any one of you that are aware of how important literacy is to the state of Mississippi, you understand that any student that is not reading by third grade typically has some obstacles or um, hurdles that they have to overcome. A student that is not reading proficiently by third grade is four times more likely not to graduate from high school. And this is something that we are very passionate about here in the state of Mississippi. A student that is not reading by third grade is eight times more likely to drop out or fail out of high school. And if they're in a low income minority, they also fit into that category as well. As we look more into the data, we're fully aware of the fact that high school dropouts are typically not eligible for approximately 90% of the jobs in our economy. Reading is extremely important as students um, progress throughout elementary, middle, and also high school. For those students that are high school dropouts, um, their yearly earnings are typically less than 50% of someone who has earned a bachelor's degree. Our Literacy-Based Promotion Act and every professional learning opportunity that we put behind it is what we're doing to ensure that our students do not fall into this category. And then lastly, those students that, that, that do not graduate from high school make up nearly 50% of all households that typically are on welfare. And so as a State Department, we are very passionate about the work that we've put forth as it relates to reading. Um, reading is not only the importance of our literacy coaches, but it's a fundamental cultural change that we've had put in place across the state and that we also have in place at the State Department. I will transition over to Dr. Tanette Smith, who will share some information as it relates to the beginnings of the Literacy-Based Promotion Act and also our state reporting structure. Dr. Smith. Thank you, Dr. Davis. With those statistics in mind, we come to an understanding that reading is not just an educational issue. It's also an economic issue. Mm -hmm. So the legislators in 2013 enacted the Literacy-Based Promotion Act to eliminate social promotion and added additional structures to support foundational skills to ensure that all students were reading at or above grade level at the end of third grade. The LBPA also in 2019 raised our level of proficiency or our level to pass the, the um, third grade um, reading assessment from a level two, above a level one to above a level two or three or above. The LBPA um, enacted in um, Mississippi Code State final, the LBPA final state report was uploaded this morning to include all state and district reports. These district reports include third grade math and ELA data from the Mississippi, um, the map assessment. They also include the promotion and retention um, for kindergarten through eighth grade, as well as the third grade passing rate for um, this year. As in, in addition to the third grade good calls exemption percentages and numbers. Um, all of this was done um, to ensure that uh, districts were following in, in an alignment with our third grade or our Literacy Based Promotion Act. Districts were also required this year, because we had the impact of COVID, to upload their school board's policy <coughs> on promotion and retention. And this was in alignment to 3723.16, which requires every school district to provide a K through three literacy and numeracy screener for early childhood. Um, our third grade reading assessment final pass rate, as you can see, um, was on par uh, for 2022, or just about the same, um, at an 85% pass rate for um, our third graders, which was um, about the same as 20, 2019, which we were at an 86% pass rate. 
So we know that COVID, um, we had some unfinished learning, but our students are on an upward trajectory and we are making progress in the right directions. Um, we know that the waivers were in place from 2020 uh, and 2021, so we don't have the data there to show. However, we know that um, from looking at the data that's presented to you today, that we are making the pro progress that we need to make. From here, we'll talk about our next steps. This has given us some clear indication as to where we need to go next as a state, as a whole. Good morning. So our next steps um, for our agency, our next steps as an agency are to continue providing statewide science of reading professional learning opportunities. We have one aim, two pathways. Pathways to proficient reading for teachers, that's our educator course, and Pathways to Literacy Leadership, which is our leadership, new leadership course that we're offering. In addition, we will continue to deliver coaching supports to identify literacy support schools, and then also create a network of supports for our school-based literacy coaches. In addition, something that I'm really excited about is the launch of our Literacy Leadership Network during our Mississippi Literacy Leader Literacy Mississippi Literacy Association Conference. Literacy said a lot today. <laughs> um, to improve literacy outcomes through the development of actionable school literacy plans. Our current literacy staff is comprised of 53 literacy coaches, which include our SCIP literacy coaches, that serve 93 schools in 45 districts. Our charge for school, schools and districts is to continue utilizing screeners and diagnostic assessments to, for early identification and interventions. To utilize high quality instructional materials aligned to the science of reading and provide professional learning focused on strategies aligned to structured literacy which is the application of the science of reading to accelerate student learning. That ends our presentation. Are any, there any questions? questions? Okay, thank you very much. We, we appreciate that and appreciate the work that you're doing um, with this. Um, we all know how important it is to uh, reading is to success and uh, we appreciate the work that you're doing for the children around the state. They are pretty extraordinary ladies. Yeah. <laughs> okay, no questions then. We'll move to item two, which is a report on the uh, Mississippi Academic Assessment Program, which we know as MAP, and the achievement gap, achievement gap results from that. Good morning. morning well, Dr. we are getting set up for the presentation, um, I'll just share, I was thinking about, this is our third month in a row um, to be before you to present <laughs> data analysis. Um, we started back with our math assessments and then we moved into our accountability results. You've heard from Literacy Based Promotion mm -hmm. Act requirements and Dr. Benton highlighted our NAEP results. And so while we have yet to complete our reporting cycle from the previous school year, it's almost November. So the fall assessment window is about to open for the current school year. So we don't complete one cycle until um, we're beginning a new one. But um, with item number two today, um, in accordance with the Every Student <coughs> Succeeds Act, um, we are responsible for calculating and producing achievement gap data by subgroup. Um, and this has been calculated um, at the scores that we talk about at the proficiency um, levels or above for both the state and district level by subgroup. Um, we'll, at this time, I'll turn it over to Mr. Bureau to walk through that data, but Dr. Davis did such a, an amazing job with our vision and mission and our goal slides for the next three presentations. We'll just go right into um, the presentation of the data if, um, if that works for all of you. Okay, so um, this gap analysis is going to be consistent with what we've seen the past few years. Um, 
We'll talk about you know, just some impacts of the pandemic on the data that's lingering. Um, but what we do is we look at changes in gap performance for subgroups from the prior year to the current year. So this is 21 to 22. Um, and this includes uh, English language arts and mathematics in grades three through eight and high school and of course assessments. So all of those assessments are rolled up in the aggregate here. Um, and we only use the first attempt, as you know, there are some um, retesters in high school into course assessments. So this is kind of the methodology of how all of that works. We pull in our assessments from the most current um, school year. The first um, attempted assessment, we select the subgroups that we're gonna look at, which are defined in, in federal code for reporting purposes, and we calculate the percent proficient for each of those subgroups. And then we compute uh, the gap based on um, the difference to a reference group, which I'll show next. Uh, and then we compute the, the difference um, to report for the gap. So this is the different subgroups that I mentioned. The ones with the red check mark next to them are the reference groups. So for race, white is a reference group. So we compare um, performance of the other subgroups back to that reference group. Um, and we have economic status, disability status, English language learner status, and uh, gender. Again, these are defined by federal statute for reporting purposes. Um, and we also have our, um, our goal, uh, our long-term goal, which is required under ESSA. Uh, that's that all students reach 70% proficient um, by 2025. Well, it was 2025, now it's 2027. We moved those goals up two years in our recent addendum um, to the U.S. Department of Education as a result of the impact of the pandemic. So you'll see those reported in the gap analysis as well. Uh, so as I mentioned, we still want to note that there's still some lingering impact from the pandemic. We assess students in 2020, 2021, but as you know, um, uh, the pandemic was still uh, impacting those assessments. So I uh, want to point out to use caution when looking at progress and closing or opening uh, of those gaps from 21 to 22 um, assessments. Um, so this is what the district level report will look like. Uh, all of these gap reports have uh, been posted to board members, but will be posted online uh, after this presentation. And so we'll have these broken out by district. Uh, each of those subgroups that are um, uh, listed out by each district, and then you'll see uh, assessment data, if, uh, rates of proficiency and gaps for each of those subgroups from uh, the current year to the prior year, whether or not those gaps increased or closed, and then um, our gap to goal uh, for our long-term goals. Uh, so this rolls up to the state level aggregate, and we'll look at each of these um, subject areas. So we've grayed out 21 gap in proficiency, as I mentioned before, um, we want to caution uh, comparing performance from that year. So what I've done in the, um, uh, the, the, the right-hand column, the changing gap reports the changing gap from 2019 <coughs> to 2022. So we're looking at pre-pandemic to our most recent assessment, and you'll see changes in the gap um, for each of those subgroups. So if you see a, a, a minus sign uh, there, that, that indicates a uh, decrease in the gap or a gap closed. If there's a plus sign before the number, then that means the gap widened for each of those subgroups. Mm -hmm. So that's ELA and this is mathematics. Uh, so you'll see that there um, is inconsistent, it's consistent with uh, other, other measures that we've looked at, but math has taken a, a bigger impact in performance um, than ELA. And you see that as well in these gaps. Uh, so these subgroups are, are um, the gaps are getting wider for these subgroups. Um, so this is gap to goal, uh, looking at those long-term goals. Have we changed, have we closed that gap uh, trying to reach the 70% proficiency for our long-term goals for each of the subgroups? So we've um, made slight progress on some of these in English language arts. And this is a continuation of our subgroups, English language arts again. Um, and we've had some widening gaps in mathematics. Okay, so that's the gap analysis uh, 
uh, for districts and subgroups and whether or not they're closing from one year to the next. So the difference with the heat map is the heat map just looks at current year data. Uh, so we're looking at subgroup performance um, in ELA and math uh, and just comparing the gap for each of those subgroups and highlighting those with these color indicators. Um, so green indicates that there's no, gra no gap or the, or the subgroup is performing higher than the reference group. Yellow is a, um, is a gap less than 10 po percentage points difference from the subgroup. Gold is uh, 10 to 25 percent and red is a, a gap that's more than 25 percent points, percentage points. Okay, so this is what the heat map will look like uh, for reported for districts. Each district will have a row and you'll have uh, your subgroup reporting uh, for each of those gaps. Again, this is just current year late data comparing reference group to our subgroup. So anywhere you see those red areas, those are going to highlight areas of where gaps are, are, um, are quite wide um, and need some attention. So in this example, you can kind of see in the middle of this um, chart, there's a grouping of red around African-American gap. Um, so that would be an area that, that those districts would want to look at. Um, this is the state level aggregate uh, for English language arts gap. So uh, again, we've got uh, quite a gap there for black African American students in English language arts compared to their uh, reference group, which is white. Uh, economically disadvantaged students and students with disabilities. And you'll see uh, that being consistent in mathematics as well. Again, this is state aggregate data. So I know I moved through that fairly quickly. Again, these files will be posted online. I would encourage districts to look at um, both this year's change uh, in performance for these subgroups uh, from last year, but also go back and look at 2019 to this year um, to see uh, that progress since before the pandemic. All right, any questions on this? Mm -hmm. No. Hello, Mary, do you have a question? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, I've been muted. No, I don't have any questions. Okay, do you have a comment? No, it's rather interesting um, the, how the demographics work out. I'd rather take some time and look at the um, um, numbers again online. So, okay. Any other questions or comments? Well, thank you all. We, um, you all, are also up next with the ACT results. Uh, but y'all are amazing that you've dealt with all this data and you're still standing and not cross-eyed and, and, smiling. Doing and smiling that's right thank you okay so at this time we'll just move to right, move right into, into their, the uh, reporting spring of ACT. the ACT results Okay, so each year we report out ACT results both for the 11th graders who are participating in the statewide census of the um, ACT assessment, so all juniors um, that are paid for by the state. Uh, and we also report out for the graduation, uh, graduating um, class, so that would be the students that graduated this past spring. Um, just as a review, the ACT is a, an on-demand uh, assessment that is uh, functions to provide a predictive measure of college readiness is not and is not a content performance measure. Um, it measures performance in English, math, reading, science, uh, and there are composite scores that are calculated um, based on the average of those components. Uh, and also note, um, we get a lot of questions about this. ACT sets benchmarks for each of those subject area tests. These are the benchmarks, 18 and English, 22 in Algebra and Social Studies, and 23 in Science. So grade 11 results, so this, these are our students uh, in, uh, that were juniors that took the assessment this past year. So just as of, of note, you'll see the changes in the number of the students tested um, from 19 to 20 to 20, 21. That's kind of come back up from last year. Composite score, um, slight change. 
uh, not a full uh, recovery from 19, but 17.4 uh, average. This is a chart showing each of those uh, components in the ACT and how those uh, how students have performed on those across the three years, along with um, uh, the far right hand side indicates students that met all four ACT benchmark scores. So we've had an increase in um, 11th grade students that I mentioned. Um, we see in the data that students take more rigorous course taking patterns, perform higher on their composite scores on ACT. Uh, composite scores for subgroups have seen a slight increase from 21. 88 districts showed a slight increase in the score, 43 showed a slight decrease, and 10 showed no change. Um, thing to point out, slight. Uh, these changes have been um, slight over the years. That was 2011. This is the graduating class of 2022. So again, we're looking at this slide shows public and private schools, uh, number of students, and composite, composite and component scores. And then this one shows public only. This is a chart uh, similar to the prior one showing public and private school performance across the three years. Again, the graduating class. And you'll see that one thing of note here is that although in the 11th grade uh, uh, report, we saw a rebound, a little bit of a rebound um, after the pandemic, here in the graduating class you still see um, most of these are, are down from the prior. Uh, so I'd say a lingering um, impact of the pandemic. This is public only. Uh, and of course, all of this data is going to be posted online um, for you to review in more detail. Any questions or comments on this? No. Ms. Warner? No, I, I don't. No, I, I thought I voiced it. No, I don't have any. Okay. But thank you for asking. Yeah. <laughs> um, th just off the top of your head, do most schools, um, most high schools, do you know, offer an ACT prep class? Do, do we know yes. most of them do? Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. And uh, Tammy Crisetti is here. Yeah. Tammy, wave your hand there. And we've had multiple meetings since we received this report from ACT along with Alan and uh, Dr. Vandeford. And we are finding opportunities to really take greater advantage, advantage of the ACT waivers mm -hmm. that'll be working with school principals and counselors because that will afford our students at no cost to them to take the assessment another time. And what we have found in the research and the data that's been provided is that when a student has a chance to retake the ACT, their score increases with each subsequent administration. You know, that's, that's the trend. So we want to be sure we're taking advantage of that. So our teams are working across their uh, offices to, to tr develop training and supports so that they can plug back into districts. Okay. But those courses are offered. Mm -hmm. Well, there's definitely a technique to taking the ACT, too. And so those classes are very helpful and critical mm -hmm. to students to teaching them how to take the test and be successful with it. So I was just curious about that. A good question. All right, we'll move right into education. Uh, educator, uh, this is the Alan and Paula show today. Oh no, we're gonna ask Dr. Uh, Binkley to join us. Oh, okay. Us. We're, gonna, we're gonna switch out, out Alan. That, <laughs> oh, Ms. Warner, do you have a question? No, Wait. I don't have a question. I have a comment. Okay. Um, I have an appointment, and I said that I had to leave around 11.15 uh, to 11.30 so I can make it. Okay. But um, thank you, and I, I have to say, good. I'm glad with the ACT that we are showing kids how to take that test, Yeah. So, which good I think point. is very important. All but right. anyway, so don't, can't ask my opinion because I, I won't be here. Okay. All right. <laughs> but thank you. Thank you. I will see you all next week. That's right. We're going to see a lot of each other. So, <laughs> yeah, okay. You take care. All right. Thank you. All right. All right. Bye. Educator workforce updates. So, <laughs> while our first three presentations this morning focused on goals one, two, and six, all around uh, students being prepared for uh, college and, and the workforce, as well as um, their performance on our statewide assessments and um, ensuring that they are proficient when they exit, we're going to shift to goal four. 
and Dr. Van Cleve is going to provide an overview of the results of the 21-22 teacher retention survey, as well as share some of the statewide strategies um, in response to the feedback that we received. Right. Dr. Van Cleve. Thank you so much. Good morning, and thank you for the opportunity to share today's information item as an update on Mississippi's educator workforce. So jumping right in, as Dr. Vanderford mentioned, this particular item centers around goal four. And within that, though, we do believe that a strong educator workforce is indeed critical to achieving many of our positive student outcomes, such as those listed in goals one, two, three, and six. So within this particular effort to achieve goal four, um, we within the Office of Teaching and Leading work to support our educators across their career continuum, from recruitment to retirement, or as I sometimes like to call it, from day one to day done. So with that being said, today's presentation is really gonna focus on those efforts around recruitment, hiring, supporting, empowering, and ultimately retaining our teachers, even as we see a strong degree of interconnection with our efforts to prepare, license, and ultimately support those educators through retirement as well. So as a brief overview of the teacher retention survey, MDE developed the teacher retention survey based on North Carolina's working conditions survey, Tennessee's educator survey, and Mississippi-specific initiatives. The teacher retention survey launched on April 18, 2022, and it closed on July 29, 2022. In sum, 6,760 Mississippi teachers responded to the survey, of which 5,856 Mississippi teachers completed the survey out of a total of 31,641 teachers for the 2021-2022 school year. The anonymous survey addressed factors such as recruitment, onboarding, support, community involvement, school leadership, and compensation. And at 71 questions long, the survey took an estimated 25 minutes to complete. So we do believe that our teachers who voiced their perspectives in this survey were both committed to doing so and saw some value in taking that time. What it also means for us today is that we could talk about these results all day long and <laughs> likely not get to many of the action items on today's agenda. So for the purpose of today's information item, we're going to give a high-level overview, as Dr. Ben as Dr. Vanderford mentioned, of key survey findings along with some of our aligned strategies. That being said, Dr. Benton has already committed to deeper dives into these results within agency cross-office meetings along with some of our advisories like our principals, superintendents, teacher advisories. So all that being said, this is just the start of a longer conversation. With that, we'll start digging into some of the results. So we're in this recruitment bucket around how we advertise our positions. And so in response to the question, where did you first hear about an open position, teacher respondents said that they primarily heard about them from colleagues and friends. Far less so frequent were um, responses around online job boards and job fairs at 3% overall. So it is definitely more of a local network sort of um, impact here. And again, for those of you who are mathematically inclined, these are only the high level strategies. These are only the high level where they had the greatest overall degree of agreement or the least area of agreement, which is why these results aren't going to add up to 100% on either this slide or the ones coming forward. So when we get into um, recruitment in terms of applications, we know the decision to look into a job is one thing, actually applying is another. In Mississippi, geographic location had the greatest overall impact on a teacher's decision to apply. This together with the national finding that over 50% of teachers live within 20 miles of where they graduated high school highlights the importance of grow your own efforts as a long-term strategy. In the short term, however, we found it very interesting the role that a conversation with school leaders plays in somebody's decision to apply even before they do so. So that was an interesting finding from that. Again, like job fairs, recruitment events had less of an impact overall at 2%, which may have some implications for how districts and or universities choose to allocate that time. 
Moving into hiring, um, one of the things that teachers really noted was that there is, by and large, um, the focus is on interviews, interviews with the principal, central office interviews. Um, far less frequent were tasks within a hiring process, such as teaching a demonstration lesson or an activity using student data, those being interesting findings, given that those are some of the key activities of teaching. So it's just a, a point of reflection. There are a number of different reasons that could be administrators feeling pressure to hire in the midst of of shortages, simply being pressed for time, but we did think it was a point of reflection nonetheless. Moving then from hiring into onboarding, teacher respondents over, gen, tended to lean towards the clarity and overall fairness of the interview process, even more so than things such as the user-friendly application or the efficiency of HR processing in and of itself. Then as we think towards our new teachers, there were a few key findings. One being that 23% um, of teacher respondents highlighted a formally assigned mentor as the greatest influence in their decision to continue teaching as a new teacher. On the other hand, new teacher seminars were less influential at 3%. The, the um, tough reflection here is that 19% of teacher respondents indicated that they received no new teacher support. So again, room for growth potentially in this area. Moving into working conditions, so from new teachers to supporting all Mississippi teachers, this section is aligned with North Carolina's Teacher Working Condition Survey. It was by far the longest overall section of the survey, so here we're only going to highlight some of the big areas of agreement across these four domains. So within the instructional practices domain, the neat news is that 91% of respondents agreed that their curriculum is indeed aligned to the Mississippi College and Career Readiness Standards, which does point to the impact of some of our statewide initiatives, such as Mississippi Instructional Materials Matter. Similarly, 84% of teacher respondents agreed that they have sufficient access to instructional technology, which may again point to the impact of statewide initiatives such as Mississippi Connects. And even as we'll continue our focus on promoting safe and orderly schools, 75% of teacher respondents did agree that they believe they work in a safe school environment. Circling back to community involvement, teacher respondents noted that 85% um, noted parents and guardians are provided with useful information. There is a little bit of variability within that domain that we're going to move into um, just because we wanted to offer a balanced perspective on this survey. So we're highlighting a lot of the strong areas of agreement, but we also wanted to highlight some of the weaker overall areas of agreement. But here we wanted to note, there weren't any areas of, of disagreement that were over 50% in the survey. The reason for that, again, for the mathematically inclined is because there was a neutral value as well within the survey. So one thing that we think within our commitment to ensuring educator effectiveness, an important finding, there was a weaker area of agreement around professional learning being aligned to growth areas from observations. Um, similarly, in terms of student conduct and parent uh, guardian support, we're weaker overall areas of agreement at 48 and 40 percent respectively and then the weakest area of agreement overall was around efforts to reduce routine paperwork at 37 percent. So then as we move and thinking about how we can then empower our, our teachers and our teacher leaders across the state, um, we dug into this teacher leadership and compensation domain and found several key findings. The first was that 64% of teacher respondents did indeed feel valued as a result of last year's teacher pay raise during our last legislative session. Second, the majority of respondents are encouraged to participate in school leadership, which we also found to be important because in a different area of the survey, 40% of teachers noted that they primarily learn from other teachers. So there is some implication for um, school leadership uh, engagement for teachers and their leadership moving forward. Then where it gets interesting in this domain is that some of our strongest areas of agreement are also closely connected with some of our weakest areas of agreement. And so while teachers, for example, did indeed feel valued as a result of the pay raise, there was a weaker response with regard to current salary satisfaction. And also similarly, while participants participation in school leadership was a strength, group problem solving was a weaker area of agreement. And then when we think towards John Hattie's effects I've study, which found collective teacher efficacy to have one of the strongest overall impacts on student achievement, that connection between collective teacher efficacy and group problem solving is a point of reflection for schools, districts, and for us as a state. 
So then we didn't, we, all of these factors get into teacher retention, but we, we didn't want to just avoid the question. So we asked the question outright, what most impacts your decision to keep teaching or to lead, to leave teaching? And so what we found within asking this question is that school leadership overall, it found that to be the most influential factor in a teacher's decision to keep teaching. And we similarly found school leadership to be the most influential factor in a teacher's decision to leave teaching at 19%, even slightly more so than teacher leadership and compensation overall. So we wanted to unpack that domain a bit more in terms of school leadership. And what we found is some areas of, of strength and progress and some areas for growth. When we think about things that we typically attribute to rigor, things like using data to drive student learning, maintaining high standards and high expectations, there was a lot of agreement on that. When we think about areas and skills that are more closely related to things like interpersonal relationships, there was weaker response, such as teachers having appropriate autonomy, having that atmosphere of trust and comfort where you can raise issues with your administration was a weaker area of agreement. So that was a lot of information in a short amount of time. So to summarize our key findings, number one, MDE's efforts to strengthen instruction through strategies such as Mississippi Instructional Materials <laughs> Matter and Mississippi <laughs> Connects are indeed having a positive impact. Teachers primarily learn from other teachers. Three, the professional growth system should drive professional learning. And four, school leadership is the biggest factor in teacher retention and attrition in Mississippi currently. So in terms of the aligned strategies that we have moving forward as promised, one of those is the Mississippi Teacher Residency, which does include that formal mentoring component that our teacher resident, that our teacher met, is found to be so influential when they were a new teacher. And so with the support of ESSER funds and you all, we have significantly expanded the Mississippi Teacher Residency from some of our pioneer pi partners like the Gulfport School District to now include the universities and districts that you can see here now. Um, so again, we're really excited about that expansion, the potential to expand new teacher supports as a result. And then another neat thing about the Mississippi Teacher Residency is in collaboration with the Office of Special Education, it has led to the development of our Mentoring and Induction Toolkit. The Mentoring and Induction Toolkit is intended to be a one-stop shop of free mentoring and induction resources such that any school or district can literally start a mentoring and induction program tomorrow should they so choose. The QR code will take you to the toolkit homepage where I personally want to highlight the ongoing training and support section which includes a series of monthly professional learning opportunities that are aligned to both professional growth system standards and high leverage practices for increasing inclusive education. All the PowerPoints are ready to go, ready to be downloaded, such again that if any district or, or uh, school wanted to start a program, they would have those resources at their fingertips. And the best part is they're all free. Another free resource that we have collaborated with the Office of Professional Development on is aligning our professional development catalog to professional growth system domains and standards so that we can assist administrators in selecting professional opportunities professional learning opportunities that are aligned with professional growth system trends. And so with that, this is an effort to increase the level of content specific supports for some of the pedagogical trends that administrators are seeing within their building. These are free sessions as well available by administrator request and that is indeed our current catalog. And then as our final strategy, Dr. Benton has charged us with considering the role that school leaders play in teacher retention more broadly by considering a reboot of our approach to orientation to school leadership or OSL credits needed for conversion from it to a standard renewable administrator license. And so as Mrs. Altman noted, we are currently in the process of reviewing this systems frame for school leadership within our superintendents and our principal advisories to continue to gain their feedback. So we look forward to additional updates on that front. And with that, again, many thanks to all of our MDE colleagues who assisted us with getting the word out in this survey, helping with the analysis and our aligned strategies. And with that, we can take any questions or comments. Good job. Yeah. Dr. McGee? One, one quick question about your comment about mentors. Was that for a single year or an ongoing year? 
That question didn't dig into the number of years. This is our first run with the survey, so I think that for future surveys would be very interesting about the number of years. We but found it, it very valuable to not only do it the first year, but continuous yep. years. Yep, absolutely. I think that's a great point. Anyone else have any questions or comments? It was a good report, a lot of information. We uh, appreciate that, and it's exciting to see it. Uh, some of the responses are interesting, mm -hmm. some of the um, uh, percentages. Dr. Benton, you have something you'd like to add? I just am so proud of the leadership provided day in and day out by these folks sitting at the table, and Alan and Jackie that said, went back. You see, we've got some great folks here at the department leading this work, and we are really grateful to them. Thank you very much. Dr. Gavin, you have a couple of contracts. Yes, good morning. We have two contracts to bring before the board this morning. Uh, one is uh, contract 5A. It is a modification to the interim superintendent for the Tunica County. That is Dr. Pulley. We're modifying that contract to extend it through June of 2023. And the second contract is a renewal with the National Center for the Improvement of Educational Assessment for the upcoming uh, fiscal year 2023. And that is year five of five of this contract. Okay, I think everyone's familiar with the Tunica County contract. Anybody have any questions on these before we vote? Okay, we have a motion. We're going to take both of these, uh, item 5A and 5B, in one motion. Do we have a motion? So moved. Okay, we have a second. Second. Okay. Any questions on these? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, thank you. Um, we will move to item six, which is reports for low performing schools. As we get ready to move into this item, this is one that Dr. Sonia Robertson and I'll present together. I'm pulling that up. Here we go. At the department, we recognize and embrace our responsibility to develop strong policies, systems of support, and accountability systems that when implemented well set the stage for our students in Mississippi to receive a world-class education as outlined in the mission. We have those six goals, and you've seen those again in all of our presentations, and I agree that Dr. Davis really teed those up nicely. And I think that you could say you saw each of those goals reflected in the presentations that preceded this one. We want to spend a little time, Dr. Robertson and I, um, talking with you about a strategy that we are employing to really drill into goal six, every school and district rated C or higher. And Micah, your comments couldn't be, have been more timely to prepare us for this discussion and the slide that Dr. Davis shared about the results that take place when third graders aren't proficient when they leave and um, the future that awaits. That's, that should be enough to compel us to really stay focused on goal six. So with that, there are currently two mechanisms for the department to work with low-performing, persistently failing school districts. We have two options. We're going to spend some time really thinking about option one, the Mississippi Achievement School District, and you see there that code section that relates to that, and then option two, which is uh, where the governor can declare a state of emergency in an extreme condition. At our time today, we want to look a little bit at uh, the Mississippi Achievement School District. In October of 2017, the State Board approved the priority criteria for the Achievement School District, and we refer to that as ASD um, throughout the state. In 2019, two districts became the first districts 
to be incorporated into that achievement school district. They are Yazoo City and Humphreys County. Their first operational year was in 2019-2020. And we all know what happened early in 2020 when the schools closed, doors shut down, business, the world as we know it. Um, on March the 19th in 2020, the State Board granted approval for districts and schools to maintain their same accountability designation in the 2021 the school year that they had in the 2019-20 school year. Um, and then this last part is what's really important. With no cumulative impact for cases for multiple years with the same designation may lead to a more severe consequence because we had a break in comparability from 2018-19 uh, to our next administration, which was this past year. So you've seen these results, maybe not presented in this way, and I know that's really difficult for you to see there. At your tables, you have a handout that has this chart that you may be able to zoom in on that a little bit um, closer. But we have five districts in our state that have a pattern of underperformance. They are not where they need to be yet, and yet being a key word. And you see those identified there, those five districts. The second chart has the list of schools within the districts and their performance level on our most recent administration. In Amit County, you'll see that 50% of the schools were rated failing. In Clarksdale, 25%. In Humphreys, 66%, in Wilkerson, 50%, and in Yazoo City, 100%. I think you will agree with me that we have work to do, and I think you would also agree that it's possible. Micah, thank you. You, you reminded us of that today. So um, while we have already been supporting each of our districts, each of those five districts, we are really doubling down and intensifying what those supports look like to become a little bit more prescriptive, directive, and supportive in the days ahead, particularly in these five districts. We've had multiple internal meetings, cross-office meetings, not just the academic team. The academic team working with Mr. Crayman's team as he's gone into the data for each of these districts and to really look at the trajectory trajectory of performance historically and then into the future. And our plan is to use that with the executive leadership of the department as well as our junior leaders working hand in glove with the district leaders in these five uh, districts in the weeks to come. With that, I will transition to Dr. Robertson and she will give you more specific information about our approach that we are going to employ this year. So thank you, Dr. Benton. Mm -hmm. So I also want to thank everybody that is prepared, uh, has presented today from the other offices and from our, our um, board members, our student board members, our representatives, because it really has laid the foundation for this information mm -hmm. um, piece. And so I just appreciate just the continuity and just building up the importance for this part of the onboard meeting. So thank you so much for that. So as Dr. Benton shared, it's critically important to be more focused and targeted with our supports in our goal to meet goal six, in particular with these districts that have been noted. So this week, we began by um, going through a process that I'm going to share with you in just a moment. Um, as you can see on the screen, you'll see a portion of the timeline, and I have another slide that has some additional information. But I'm going to give you a high-level overview just to be mindful of the time to kind of let you know which direction um, we're going based on what Dr. Benton has shared. So beginning um, this week, we really started with notifying these districts to let them know what would be happening. So that has taken place. Um, the districts have also been provided with um, a slide deck that they will be involved with, um, that they will react to for an interview that will happen with MDE leadership. And that leadership consists of executive leadership team members, as well as members from the program offices, from um, various or select program offices. And those interviews will actually, actually take place 
early in the month of November. So by the middle of November, we will have engaged with all of these districts around these um, specific um, focus areas within that slide deck. And within that slide deck, the focus areas are achievement, instruction, and fiscal allocation. And so the districts will be responding, and of course we can share with the board a copy of that template that the districts are responding to. Within that template, they will be reacting to some information that we're presenting to them that we prepare for them to be able to share about, as well as asking them to share certain information with us about um, those three areas. So next week, <laughs> so next week what we will do is um, set up some time with the districts just to answer any questions they might have about the process. So we want to make sure that we connect with them before we actually go to them in their, in their districts to have this conversation. And so some of you may be familiar, we have done interviews before where we've asked districts to come to us or schools to come to us, but this time we are actually going to spend time in the district with them face to face. Um, to have this conversation. So part of that process is going to involve, once we um, get the conversation done and have that engagement, we're also going to have our program leads in the Office of Instruction and Curriculum really go in and focus in and look at those instructional um, standards or process standards in the accountability system. So we want that to inform the support deployment that happens when we deploy supports. And so our focus areas are on proficiency for English and math. And so our, our team will be going in looking at instruction in those areas primarily. Um, following the instructional audit, some members of my team, and you all know that I do have coaches on my team um, that support our schools. Coaches from my team will be assigned as, we've kind of used the term or phrase, continuous improvement strategist. And so they will serve as that connector with the district team leads and the MDE to make sure that coordination of supports, however they're deployed based on the information or the data or the conversation or the, you know, the assessment, based on what that looks like, our team will lead the direction of those supports in the district once the supports are deployed. And we'll engage regularly with the district team as well as the team within the program offices to make sure that we're on point. Now this does involve the development of a plan. Um, one of the things that we have done though is work to really make sure it's streamlined, that it's focused on, it has a narrow focus on ELA and math, um, and that it is going to be something that again is monitored not only through the um, continuous improvement strategists, but also through the program offices that are deploying those supports to ensure alignment. So I kind of have go, I've kind of gone through the entire timeline just kind of talking, <laughs> just speaking, but what I did want you to know is that the intent is for deployment to happen in the beginning of the 22-23 year, right? So in January of 2023, the expectation is that the assessments would have been done, the interviews would have been done, and the coaches or other supports from the agency will have been deployed based on the um, information or the assessment that has been received, and that this will take place all the way through August of 2023. And the reason we chose August 2023 is that many of these districts have summer learning. And that summer learning is typically focused on ELA and math um, supports to, to, to build gaps or to, to identify and strengthen those gaps. So we want to make sure we have support available to the districts during that time. But also, between March and July, there's a lot of planning that's going on for the upcoming school year. So that also gives districts an opportunity to engage with the people that are coming in from the MDE to support, to, um, to help to inform maybe some of their planning as they move forward into the 
2024 school year. So there are a lot of cogs in motion here. Um, we've got a lot of pieces moving. But again, I'll say to, um, to, to come to a conclusion, I believe that most of everything that was shared today around the data, around just improvement and the desire for all schools and districts to be rated C or higher really do undergird this effort that we're pushing forward today. So the charge from Dr. Bitten was, okay, we've got to do something to support these districts. What does that look like? And then the conversation moved forward from there. So um, I think that was the last part of the slide. Y'all pardon my little trembling. I just get a little nervous sometimes when I'm <laughs> in front of an audience. But thank you so much for your, your attention. And if you have any questions. Any, uh, Mr. Miller? Uh, first of all, this is a very aggressive plan, but I think that's what's needed for mm -hmm. these schools. So I thank y'all for doing that. Uh, I'm curious about when you go to them and meet, mm -hmm. who do you require to be there on their part? So on their part, the superintendent, the board president, and then they have an option of two other district leadership team members. Okay, good. That, that, to me, that's important that the board people there as well yep. because they need to know what's going on. Yes, sir. And plus, they have to buy into it as well. Yes, sir. Yeah. I spoke with each superintendent um, over the last four or five days, over mm -hmm. the last week, I'll say that, directly to let them know. Um, I didn't want them to find out about that today, uh, that we were coming to partner with them. And they also received a letter, as did their pre, uh, school board president. They should be in the receipt of that yesterday, hopefully. Um, yeah, thank you all very much. You're welcome. Yep. So, Dr. Robinson, <clears throat> I want to look at Clarksdale. Um, where is their high school? You know where their high school is on this list? Maybe don't, it's no problem. But what I'm saying is, 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 this, an, is this a K through 8 world, or is this a 9 through 12 on one of these F schools? So, I. I don't have the breakdown, but I believe the I don't believe the high school is an I F. I, I believe the high school. I didn't think so either, but yes. I didn't. Yes, remember. sir. And then, so what I've done is that today I've been looking at ACT data, and it looks like reading in English is their major issue. So to me, that's a, a an easily correctable thing in that one yes. school district based on the data we have today. Yes, so, and you know, and I guess the other is probably well. I mean, you know, the Azusa City High mm -hmm. School is. The high school is performing, that just means we've got to do some better job with reading in English, like you said, on the K through three and three through eight levels. So. And those are going to be our two target areas right yeah, there to drill in on English language arts and mathematics, gotcha. proficiency. Yep. And our goal is to walk alongside the districts. Um, it's, it's not to execute on uh, options one or two, it is to change lives in those districts. Um, every child deserves the opportunity that Micah had this past year, and that's what our focus is. And another question I would seem to ask, it's really not under our jurisdiction, but what kind of preschool experience are these guys and gals receiving we've, before they, we've got that. they walk into our yeah. kindergarten, and how much of that's academic focus? Let, let, let me tell you the uh, coaches' services that we're, we were leveraging, just some of them, <laughs> early childhood, literacy, the digital coaching, the data coaching, the leadership, um, but you know we you can't we have an all hands on deck approach, right. but it needs to be very thoughtful, methodical, and coordinated. So we're going to use those data points that John Craman he's very talented at many things, not just building a new MSA system. You know he's helped us with some of the um, projections on our um, performance, so that we'll be able to drill in there. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank I you, think the Solomon. one thing about this, as, as you were going through your steps, is uh, it's not punitive. No, ma'am. It is, it is to be um, helpful and to uh, guide and, and uh, hopefully support right. yes. uh, these school districts to help them know how to help their students. Mm -hmm. and, and the bottom line is it's a better way for children. That's and, right. And that's what's important. So... We Thank appreciate you. the work, and we look forward to uh, hearing from some of your experiences. Yes, ma'am. Let me ask Thank a you. question. Yes, uh, yes. Uh, Mr. Jacobs. If uh, the, uh, some of these districts don't achieve where we're trying, what's the next step for those districts? Uh, that would be consideration of the option one that was shared at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Our goal is, though, to help them 
realize what they desire. They get up every day, I know, wanting to be successful, and we're going to do our part to help them get there. So, but that, that is the option, sir. Sounds good. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. All right, item seven are the, are the uh, items on the consent agenda, items A through E. Uh, are there any questions on those before we call for a motion? Do, if not, do we have a motion to approve item seven, uh, items A, B, C, D, and E? So moved. Okay, is there a second? Second. Okay. All in favor? Um, any opposed? Okay, thank you. Uh, before we consider uh, an executive session, um, we are sorry to announce that today is Bailey Blau's last day with us as our um, board attorney. She is leaving the department to go to another state agency. And uh, so we uh, want to thank Bailey for her assistance that she's given us uh, over the last several months that she's been the lead attorney. Um, uh, Jay Woods, who, is he still in the building? He's in, in the, the room? back. He is. Oh, in the back, yeah. Um, will be our uh, board attorney. He'll be assuming these duties um, until a full-time replacement is named for Bailey. So we thank you for the work that you're doing, uh, you have done for us. and. Uh, we're sorry to see you go. Somebody's getting a good attorney. And uh, so we, we thank you, though, and, and uh, it's, it's good. It's always legal counsel is important. <laughs> and, and Bailey's a, a calm voice. She's always very thorough and very calm. And so we wish you the best in your new position. Thank you very much. Thank you for your service. Yeah. Okay, we will entertain a motion now that we enter executive session. I move the board consider making a closed determination of the need to go into executive session. Okay, do we have a second to that? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Okay.
in accordance with Mississippi Code Annotated Section 254174A and K, the State Board of Education has moved to go into executive session to discuss discrete personnel matters related to the state superintendent search process for the Department of Education, as well as Section 254174B to discuss strategy sessions or negotiations with respect to prospective litigation, litigation, or issuance of an appealable order.
meeting will be on November the 3rd. Where are we meeting, Sonia? Here? In this building, yes. November the 3rd uh, will be this meeting. And then our next regular board meeting is November the 10th. And that is in the Madison County School Board Association building, which is also on Highland Colony. Okay. Any other announcements? <laughs> I was going to roll over on them, so. Okay. I didn't have mine on to begin with, and I was like, oh, I can't see anything. I don't think they have those. Yeah, Steve's getting old.